Today I'd like to introduce you to a friend and someone I have a personal connection with because we share the same first name. He's the lead guitarist and vocalist of the rock band Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown. And hold on, let me just read his resume of bands he's toured in open war. Jeff Beck, Aerosmith, Leonard Skinner, Joe Bonamassa, B.B. King, ACDC, and Guns N' Roses to name a handful. And I feel kind of stupid that I didn't know this when he came over. I'm gonna have to talk to him next time I see him about it. He won a Grammy in 2024 for Best Contemporary Blues Album with the band Larkin Poe. His wife is in that band and he plays guitar and the band does production work. They won a Grammy. Dude's younger than I am. Tyler also has his own signature Fender Stratocaster. And today, being released, breaking news, Tyler has a brand new signature amp with Supro. Needless to say, this guy's got it going on and Sweetwater sent me his new signature amp and I figured since I know Tyler personally and I met him at Sweetwater's Guitar Fest, I'd invite him over for the most epic of guitar hangs. Thanks to Sweetwater for sponsoring this video and check out the link in the description if you're interested in this Tyler Bryant Supro signature amp as well as any other of your gear needs. Sweetwater's got it. We had to, of course, turn the amp up to 10. We did that. We had to talk about Tyler breaking a string on stage while performing with Jeff Beck. And we had to talk about Tyler's scintillating guitar technique and blues phrasing, as well as that one guitar that got away. All that and more is next. Without further ado, Tyler Bryant. <laughs> Swampy drop D never fails. I know. <laughs> it makes me want to make a song. What is it like to have the best name in the world? It's good, man. I was thinking that uh, we should get some stickers made that say like Tyler Squared. <laughs> yeah, T Squared. Yeah. Terminator 2 is like one of the best movies ever. T2. T2. There's a lot of good things working for us. I've been called Trevor. I've been called Taylor. That's the worst one. I get Taylor a lot. I get Taylor Brown or Taylor Brantley or... Taylor Brown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, it's Taylor Brown. At least your last name's like kind of an easy one to spell when you hear it. Yeah, the son of Lars. Yeah, Lars. Uh, that's usually what I say. Dude, great to have you in yeah, this man. joint. We met a couple months back at Sweetwater and yeah. uh, just hit it off. Got to jam, got to hang. Yeah, that was cool, man. It was uh, cool to like meet a kindred spirit there amongst the... Guitar Fest Madness. Whoa, is that, a, is that one of the Satch guitars? Yeah, 
I love that you have a light on that. There has to be a light, otherwise you won't know the half of the coolness of Dude, it. Dude, that's wicked. <laughs> David Bond villain, uh, he painted that front and Satch painted the back. I have so to yeah, see that. That's wicked cool. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. How do you say this amp up here? Fuchs. Wouldn't want to thought. Yeah, you know, I get away with it somehow. YouTube hasn't been like, does that say f back there? Yeah. <laughs> but we got some different amps here. What's What's going on with this? Oh, so this is my new signature amp with Supro, and uh, I'm I'm proud of it. When I was I was talking with Supro about the different ways of, um, to market this amp, I was like, we have to send one to Tyler. Yeah. Because we had talked about getting together to hang, and I was like, well, you should get an amp in the mail, and then we should hang. You played a lot of amps in your day. Yeah, How the yeah. heck do you even go about designing? A signature amp what are what are the things that you put into this well i don't know how you are i've i've not really ever met an amp that i didn't like okay i like amps you know but i like specific things about amps and the the whole way this started was i got the black magic reverb and i was like this is a killer sounding amp i like when i say i like a lot of amps i like a lot of amps i don't like I don't like them enough to put them on stage. Sure, you know, there have sure. yeah, been yeah. a very small handful of amps that I've like liked enough to just take out on the road. And I started taking the Black Magic Reverb out and playing it in conjunction with a bassman or in conjunction with a Marshall or like, one, I've got this like 50-watt uh, hand-wired orange head that I love. Um, so I was using it in conjunction with louder amplifiers. Just yeah. kind of got a wild hair and I called Supro and said, can you just make this amp but more? Like, I love the way this amp sounds, but can you just give it more? They just made it more powerful, louder, um, so where you can sit it na down next to a drummer on a loud stage um, and kind of get some juice out of it. Right. I'm, I love the tremolo on this thing. And I've been using, in a live setting, I've been using two of them and just kind of leaving the tremolo on one of them. So I've got my nice. direct, clean, my solid anchor sound, and then I've got one that's just sort of, and I might even set them up on both sides of me, so it's sort of a, a, a little cool swir phase. swirly effect, yeah. We put military-grade tubes in it to just give it, like, the extra volume. So it's 35 watts, Class A, but... To me, it hits kind of like a 50 watt, like a basement or something. Right. Um, you ever get an amp and you're like, oh, this knob does this, and then you realize you can push it, and then if you hit a button and it does something completely different, that's not my style. I get the allure of those amps, but I wanted this to be very simple. So you got two channels, which are wicked. The first channel has like this extra bright cap on it, which the original Blackmagic didn't have, and so that just gives it more of like a shimmer. Um, but it also does something to the low end when you blend it with the second channel. The master volume works like I want a master volume to work, like kind of an attenuator. Right. Not, you know, sometimes the master volume just sucks the character out of the amp. That's usually the only thing I don't like about amps is I have to kind of get it to a certain point. Usually my favorite amps, once you're past that tiny, you know, assuming it's a tube amp, once you're past that little breaking point, it's always going to be good. Yeah. There's always a sweet spot with amps, but... yeah. The long, the longer that range of sweetness lasts is yeah. what I look for. Like right now, I have the amp probably on seven, um, and then just the master volume down, so that we we can sit here and not yeah. die. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not even two p.m. yet. I'll tell you. See, that's too too much for me. I'm like a, a pinch of salt guy. You know what I mean? Like, I like that. A little more. A little more. <laughs> There's the sweet spot. Yeah, that's to me, that's like the right amount of reverb for my thing. It's 11 o'clock for your reference. Is it 11 o'clock? 
Like what kind of reverb are you into? With this particular amp, you can inspirational. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. sitting out there i like that see i would i would buy that it's great for a certain thing yeah but the way you're looking at an amp is it's a tool for my performance yeah because you play with the shakedown mm -hmm. you pro you play with a lot of people i know but yeah. you're looking at it through that lens mm -hmm. and what can be most versatile but also the most practical i don't know how you feel about this but so certain amps like even um some princeton's like i have a 65 princeton at home and I love that amp, especially when it gets to that breakup point. But then a lot of times if you hit it with a fuzz or an overdrive, you can bit. just kind of hear the speaker working a little hard, which can be cool if that's the the vibe you're after. But I wanted this to have like enough headroom where you could really drive it with a pedal and still keep that percussive low end yeah. without the speaker kind of folding under the pressure. I dimed it when I got it. Just pretty, to see pretty what it fun, was doing, right? Shaking these studio walls. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love that. Should we crank? Yeah. Do the crank test? I'll adjust the volume level on this mic and we'll see. That's a great. That's that's the amp on ten. That's how I like it, you know. A neighbor just throws a brick through the wall. <laughs> you gotta turn it up to get the real mojo. I remember seeing, when I saw Jeff Beck for the first time, the tech came out and turned the amp on, and it was th this was the sound. And I remember being like, hell yeah, it's about to happen. And then he came out, and it got he kicked something on, and it got louder, and I was like... <laughs> It, it starts to surround you then all of a sudden you're in it when yeah, yeah. when it's quiet and that's that's great too but when whenever you're like oh there's no escaping this yeah. then you just have to be in it i had this idea of adding an extra non-functional knob oh yeah which would be like the the sound man knob the, oh yeah so like oh yeah i'm turning it down yeah and then just a knob that didn't do anything like when the sound guy says to turn down your amp and you just adjust the treble a little bit watching jeff beck he's playing the whole instrument He's, you think he's the best guitar player ever? He's one of my favorites. I loved, I mean, even like some of the like later stuff he was doing, he did. He had this song called Pull It. He had the, the whammy bar, but it was like... Uh... You know, <laughs> and he was like doing it with the whammy bar, and I remember being like, whoa, this yeah. is so weird, just the rhythm of it and everything, and it was Pull It. You, whoever's watching has to go check that track out because it, it's so inspiring. <laughs> I got to do quite a bit of touring with him and oh wow man. um I got to to jam with him quite a lot and the first I was supposed to be opening solo acoustic and the first show that I did I broke a string on my acoustic so I grabbed no. a strat and and started rocking and it was like there wasn't any hard rule. I think I'd kind of created this scenario in my mind where it was like, there can only be one Strat on stage and it must be <laughs> Jeff's, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And so a few nights in, I got away with kind of playing my electric 
on night one. I thought maybe I'll do that for a song or two the next night. And it, it, it was just booked as an acoustic tour. I had built this whole scenario in my head where it was like, this is the forbidden fruit. Yeah, you must sure. not plug in electric. And therefore I had to. Yes. And so someone came, someone from the tour came up to me and said, hey, you know, Jeff wants to talk to you in the dressing room. Uh oh. And I was like, oh shit, I'm gone. I went in there and he was like, hey, yeah, you know, you're doing a good job. I wanted to see if you wanted to jam with us tomorrow night. And I was like, oh, oh hell yeah. On stage? Like, with you? You know, and I I went out and like laid in the back of the touring van and just sat there and like freaked out to myself. I was like, this, I'm going to play with Jeff. And because I'm, you know, I used to have his record covers pinned up on my wall. And he didn't tell me what song we were going to play. And I'm going, what the, like, what if he picks one of the, you know, the tough ones, which are almost all of them. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of tough you know, ones. <laughs> yeah, like, almost and all of them. And what do you them. do? Like... And, then I, and then I started to realize, like, how out of my depth I felt, which was exciting. So I stayed up all night because I was driving myself in a van you know, following the tour and sure. just opening every night. And I was just listening. So like, you knew the songs they were playing? Maybe? I knew the songs. I had no idea how to play them on guitar. Yeah, yeah. And so I showed up to the venue, like, horrified. And he still hadn't told me what we were going to play. And he's like, hey, you want to... Right before he went on, he's like, we'll do Hire by Sly and the Family Stone. And I was like, oh. Okay, great. I know that. Easy. Great. And so I go out and start ripping with him. And at one point he comes up and he grabs my E-string and he just rips it off. <laughs> what? He's just playing with me. Oh my god! I think he, he probably knew that I was just like. He probably thought you were so excited and yeah, like... and um. But it was really just such a memorable experience and so fun to get to feel the intensity and like the intention he put behind every note. You know, like he hit something, he meant it. <laughs> got any guitars that you sold that you wish you didn't sell oh man um it's not necessarily that they were like valuable guitars but i wish i had my old jackson cool. that i had when i was in high school it was yeah. like this black 24 frets i have a picture of it somewhere guitar for me at that point was like that was what i was coming home to do right instead of like you know whatever else you do when you're 15 i was just like recording my music in audacity Sweet. Would rip inappropriate pentatonic licks everywhere. And yeah. That was the guitar. I usually, in that phase, I was like trying to trade up and I would go through phases where I'm going to, I needed this pedal now. So I'm going to switch this guitar for this guitar and this pedal guitar store circuit of used gear. I did that too. Yeah, that's yeah. the one definitely that got away. I have no idea where that guitar could be right now. Yeah. What about you? I had this Japanese Photo Flame Stratocaster. It was just a, I, in this guitar, you know, pinged me with one of those little painful reminders of that oh, guitar no. that I let was it away because like it had a it had a beautiful flame on it. Oh, cool! But I, I trade. I, I think I traded that guitar for an Epiphone Sheraton, oh. which was beautiful, and I loved that guitar. And then I traded that for like one of the Rivieras with the cool tail pieces. The, okay. Uh, yep. Yep. Funky tail pieces. I can't remember what they are, but and then I traded that for something else and. I, I was I worked at a guitar shop, so anytime a new guitar would come in, I'd be like, "It's love." That's actually so funny because I think I traded my Jackson for an Epiphone Les Paul. Wow. The Epiphones are always taking our sweet, I sweet know, guitars. Man. I love I, Epiphones, but funny. I wrote I wrote uh, one of my friends at Gibson the other day. I was like, "Do you guys have an Epiphone Riviera laying around yeah, that yeah, I could buy?" One. You know, you just buy like, it. do you know where it came? Every from? now and then, you, I start thinking about like the guitars that I had when I was a kid and just. You know, I used to line them up in my room and take a picture of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're like little pets. Yeah. This is the OG guitar of your signature guitar, right? Yeah, this is the, the guitar that Fender did the signature of. And um, I love I love this guitar. So the kind of story behind this is I have, I have one that's just like it. It's got a single coil in it. And it was stolen when I was out on the road in 
I think it was stolen in 2013. God, so many people have had their guitars stolen. Yeah. I feel like I hear stories about this all the time. Just, oh, my guitars got stolen out of a van. Yeah, it was stolen. We were out on the road, you know, and so it was like my hammer went missing. Yeah, so yeah. Like I still got to go to work, and uh, my folks pulled together. I come from like a, a really like hardworking kind of blue-collar family in Texas, and they pulled together and got me this guitar, and so I've just been carrying it around ever since. I love it, and... Five and a half years later, I got my guitar back. Found in a used car dealership in Spokane, Washington. Spokane Valley, Washington. Like where in the dealership? This dude came in, had the guitar, no case, in the back of a trunk, and was like, I want to trade you this car and this guitar for a down payment on a used Corolla or something. Yeah. So the guy who owned the used car <laughs> dealership had a Willie Nelson cover band. Okay. Gave the guy a thousand bucks for the guitar. Immediately text River City Guitars. River City Guitars, shout out. <laughs> yeah, shout out River City Guitars. <laughs> they bought your stolen guitar and sent it to you. Yeah. That's Isn't awesome. that wicked? Well, you got it back. Yeah, I got it back. But, but you know, at that point, whenever Fender approached me about doing a, a signature model, this had been, you know, this, this one had taken the brunt of the work. Yeah, yeah. And I was so used to playing this one and... Um, it had kind of become the thing and then kind of having some family significance it just felt like the the one I should do so and and ultimately this neck and the body are about the same weight it's the same exact neck profile yeah as the original one so there's enough it's the same pickups except for the bridge so it's sort of the it felt like the best of both worlds to me <laughs> describe how you developed your sound and if there's an influence in there or two you can mention or if there's like a practice routine or yeah, something. Yeah, I, like... I mean there's definitely a lot of influences. Um, I mean like a lot of people who are who become obsessed with guitar I just listen to my favorite records on repeat you know and would wake up in the morning early before school so I could listen to Johnny Winter, Albert King or Jeff Beck. Well, still is this guy in Texas named Alan Haynes that's just sort of an unsung hero of Texas blues, in my opinion, and he played a lot with his fingers, um, pretty much predominantly with his fingers, and and I learned, he has this record called Live at the Big Easy. It's not on Spotify or anything, but it's on YouTube, and I learned that record note for note, and I would just sit there, and it's, it opens with this song, Say Howdy, and I would just be like, I think we might have talked about this at Sweetwater. He, he always used a switch, and you could even hear it in some of the tunes where he'll be going for something. And, you know, kind of giving it the... Yeah. And that sort of thing, and, it, and that helped me fall in love with the Stratocaster, that record, just going, I want that sound. And he was plugged straight into a Viber King. No, no frills, just doing the thing. And I, I played that record so much that my parents were like you have to listen to something different, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, we know this song note for note now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you sing it. And I got, I ended up getting his phone number and I'd call him and leave him voicemails of like, me playing. <laughs> so I was like literally obsessed. That's amazing, I was dude. obsessed with this album. <laughs> Just a voicemail of you ripping a solo. Yeah. That's so funny. I got to know him because I saw him play at the Dallas Guitar Show. He didn't say his name. And I, I, w I remember just having one. I, have, have you had any pivotal moments like that where you like you hear a player and you go, oh my God, what is this? Yes, yes. You know, and I remember him saying, I play in Austin. If you're ever in Austin, y'all come check me out on 6th Street. Right. So I convinced my dad to drive me to Austin. And I'm not old enough to get in anywhere. And we drove down 6th Street on a Saturday night until I heard him. And it's, that's how distinct <laughs> his playing was. And I was like, that's him. Pulled over, parked, walk up. Sure enough. Damn. They wouldn't let they wouldn't let us in the club, and so he came out on the he saw me out there and came out on the street and ripped a solo, just furthering Dude. my obsession with guitar and his playing. and And I said, I want to play with you, yeah. and he was like, ah, Not tonight, you know. Right. And he said, I I host a blues jam at the Alligator Grill uh, tomorrow night, oh. so I sh I convinced my dad to stay in Austin another night, and we went to the Alligator Grill. Well, my mom and my dad took me and. 
it, I, I can't only imagine how, uh, how much I drove them crazy about that, but he got me up to jam and uncle John Turner, who used to play for Johnny winter was playing drums. Oh. So I'm like, shit, this is, this is the big time boys. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And how old were you at this point? Probably like 13, 14. Okay. And, uh, I got up to jam. He had me up for another song. And anytime he'd come around, I'd go play. And, and he kind of, he would just solo and solo. So it gave me an opportunity to work on playing rhythm. Mm -hmm. And it's all just straight blues, you know? Um, so that's, and that's really my background. I, I, I kind of, when I moved to Nashville, I thought I should, you know, figure out a way to trick people into listening to blues. So I started a rock and roll band and, uh -huh. You know, the rest is history. But, yeah, the, yeah. you know, through, like, falling in love with rock and roll, I realized all of that kind of stuff stemmed from the blues. But, yeah, practicing has just been listening to my favorite records. Then once I got um, started getting into songwriting, it was making tracks for myself to play to because I've never been just, like, a sit-down-play-to-dead-air guy. It's always been with a record, with a chord progression. Sure. Or with, in a situation like this where you play something and then you got to figure out what to do and then also just when when watching tv or sitting there the old tv unplugged m mindless that's that's like a real thing it's honestly you're like the seventh person i've had on the channel when i ask just kind of about practice routine everyone's like yeah just sit in front of the tv and you know yeah keep my fingers warm that's how i learned how to play with my fingers actually and like do, you know i mean even when i'm resting i've got the pick there because i really wanted to be able to kind of incorporate some of the finger stuff and the piano rolls or the harmonica rolls to where it's like that sort of thing. I just sit and watch TV with my guitar unplugged and the first time I learned that was uh Sat Satriani. Yep. Yeah, so I would just sit there and, and practice that slow. You know, fat. I probably drive my wife nuts because I just I still sit there today and or like this morning I picked up a little nylon string guitar and was just I was trying to do the flamenco style vibrato where it's like the tip <laughs> of your finger and you're like <laughs> that's it, <laughs> that little thing. That's always what you want to hear in the other room. <laughs> yeah. You said you're working on some new shakedown? Yeah, I've been writing some new shakedown stuff. Anything you're particularly excited about or like yeah, a memorable I've, lick you're working on? I've been digging these like um like Junior Kimbrough, R.L. Burnside sort of records that have these and, and also like really been inspired by uh, Luther Dickinson from North Mississippi All Stars, some of his riffs. Okay. Which are just real like a lot of times they're very simple. <laughs> That kind of thing. Real rhythmic. Um, so I've been messing with a few shakedown licks that are kind of inspired by that. I think the tricky part is it's like, okay, I really love the way that this person sounds. Now how can I make that sound like something that I would do yeah. naturally yeah, yeah. so that I'm not just ripping somebody off? Yeah. Do you think about that when you're writing, like as you're writing, or do you think about it when you're listening back? I think or... about it more in the production in the production phase. Like, I think writing... Um, Oftentimes I'll try to stay out of the way of like comparing Those to thoughts. anything else because you can always change a riff or sure. whatever. It's like so many times I just need a jump off point where it's like where where does the ball start rolling? And so if that's a generic riff, I'll just kind of earmark the thought and go, I'm going to come back and really sp spend some time trying to come up with a riff. Well, you it's know? interesting because we're like, oh, not another, let's not do another A thing. But each thing we do in A, just like some open yeah. flat seven one thing. But then you can make it. Yeah. And we have those tonalities, but it's just something about these guitar keys that lends themselves to all of us kind of sharing ideas in a sense. That's what I'm talking about when I was describing your playing is they're familiar elements because of the you know, rock and roll and blues background, but it's taking what's already traditional and real and, like you said, finding ways to authenticate it with your own stamp. A lot of writing I've been doing is, like, using the dumbest chords. Do you, you sit know. down and write from the guitar first? It, would you say, like, you your process starts always on guitar, or do you, like, 
start with a keyboard. Yesterday, or I started with an upright bass. I went to bre oh, breakfast nice. at a friend's house, and he had an upright bass, and he's like, have you ever played one of these facing a corner? And so I just got lost <laughs> for like half an hour in a corner with an upright bass. Do you know how to play? Um, not not well, but enough to to get by and to kind of write a thing. So next thing you know, I pulled out my phone and recorded an idea, and I made plans to meet up with some other people that I, I just canceled it and went home because I at this point I had an idea and it's like I have to now I have to do this yeah um that's exciting yeah so I went home and and chased it for five or six hours and that's my favorite thing to do is like as soon as that ball gets rolling then I'm I'm going along for the ride almost every time <laughs> by like tracks making tracks and then taking something familiar and then putting a little left turn in it and then trying to figure out now how how can we get in and out of this yes you know man well i went and saw um jet the other night at the basement East. oh really yeah they did a Dude, jet they did like a 20 year anniversary show Was of that a... get born <laughs> It was amazing, but it was cool to hear, um, you know, a lot of those songs. The impact of them was one guitar kind of with a, a thinner tone, starting a riff. Yeah. Then the band kicks in, and then the other guy comes in with the meat and potatoes. Tried and true formula that's never going to fail us. I know. Because I don't know a ton about music theory, I'm like, if we're playing an E, I know I've got a spot here, i got a spot here, i got a spot here, i got a spot here. Some places that I know are comfortable. So then it's a matter of figuring out how to get there. So yeah. I think about a lot of licks as sort of bridge licks. Okay. From like, if you have a go-to lick, and then you have another go-to lick that's down the neck, and it's like, how do you get there yeah. tastefully? So I've always heard listen to the people around you, but also listening to yourself is something I think about too. It's like, yeah. what did I just do? You yeah. Know? Like, what what did I just do? Let me maybe take a second to breathe and yeah. figure out, oh, that was kind of cool. I mean, sometimes for me, when I listen back to my myself, I wish I would be listening to myself a little bit more. I'm going, why didn't you just stop there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Stop, dude. Shut up. Yeah. You know, like you that lick you just played didn't need an answer. <laughs> just shut up. Yeah. You know? I mean, I think that's every guitar player. We all think we could play less. Yeah. Um, you think about the context that you're in. You're like, I got a lot to say right now. Yeah. So it doesn't always have to be this beautiful master yeah. built solo. Yeah. Well, and there's also, there's like a thing that happens whenever like two of us get together yeah. where we're like, we must, <laughs> we we must, must impress the world. Yeah, I don't even think about it, like impress the world, but I just get so pumped. I do I'm too, just, like, my adrenaline <laughs> takes over. Yeah. 